we have the pleasure of having Dr. Bob Bauer here with us. Dr. Bauer is from um, a professor of psychology at Highline Community College in the Seattle area. He also has a um, certificate in thanatology, which is helping folks to deal with grief and loss issues. Um, he is also one of the major players in helping with the Compassionate Friends Society in the Seattle area. Um, Dr. Bauer was generous enough to contact us and say, I'm coming up on the cruise ship. I've got time. I'd be happy to talk to folks. Um, we at Hospice looked at Dr. Bauer's background and said, you know, we need to do something for our community. And so therefore, we've brought this workshop on suicide intervention and coping with suicide loss. Um, Dr. Bauer has great credentials and I'd like to introduce him and bring him up on stage. Thanks. Thanks. Alaska, wow, what a great place. We were in Glacier Bay yesterday and they told us it's not raining you should be very happy. So, <laughs> and also thanks for applauding. I, I've been teaching college for a lot of years and uh, when you walk into the classroom, students never applaud for you. you know? <laughs> They're hoping that maybe you didn't show up for the exam, right? I know some of you. Um, so let me get a feel for who's here today. Um, how many of you have had the experience of uh, losing someone through suicide? How many of you have that? Okay, a lot of you. Well, welcome. Um, we're at the first part that we're going to cover, as you see in your packet there. And for those of you who want to follow along and take notes, that's great. For those of you who just want to put it aside and look at it later, that's great too. Um, but oh, in my class, that would be a, they would lose two points off their grade for doing that. <laughs> so, um, so the, uh, and then the second part of it will be taking a look at coping with loss after a suicide. And so, uh, over the years, I've been teaching this cl class on death uh, for more than um, 30 years now. So in 1977, uh, I first taught the course, and, and then in 2007, on the first day of class, I'm looking at 40 students sitting there with their eyes wide open wondering, what is this class on death going to be like, you know? And I said to them, well, I'd like to congratulate you because this is the 30th anniversary of me teaching this class. And then I said to them, so I want you to think back what you were doing in 1977, you know? And they're looking at me like, doesn't this guy understand? You know, I wasn't even a, a gleam in somebody's eye, okay? So, so uh, and then about 12, 13 years ago, I got involved in the Washington State Su Youth Suicide Prevention Project. Um, uh, two parents had experienced the death of their son. His name was Trevor Simpson. and. They, uh, after a couple years, decided that they wanted to do something about it. And so they went, they got, gathered all the facts about youth suicide in Washington State, and they went to the legislature. And one of the things, as many of you know, is that you do not want to get, get in the way of parents, especially parents who've experienced the death of a child. And they worked hard, and they got the Washington State Legislature back, I think it was about 1995, to put forth one million dollars toward suicide prevention, suicide intervention. And so what they did then was they looked around, who can we you know, put together uh, to, to be people who are going to be involved in this process? And they found an organization called Living Works. For those of you who are taking notes, if you want to Google that, Living Works is in Calgary. And they now have gone all over the world training people in suicide intervention and training trainers on how to do it as well. And so I applied in 1996 and in 97 then I was one of the many trainers who got trained and then I've been continuing to do that over the years and about 10 years ago offered this as a one credit class to my students at Highline and so I've trained over a thousand people in suicide intervention and in October we'll have we'll have another class and it's a, it's a weekend class. It goes um, eight hours each day, about seven hours each day and by the time they're done, these students um, uh, feel equipped to at least be able to ask the question and go out and get, get the help. And we tell them, you know, you're not gonna be a counselor and you're not gonna you know, solve all their problems, but what we're gonna do is identify that. So, so this first part of the talk today is going to be how, um, how can you identify some of the clues and what are some of the 
the ways that people are feeling and thinking as they're suicidal, and then what can you do about it? And then Dr. Kiernan is going to uh, come up and talk to you a little bit about um, what, are, what are some of the resources here that I know many of you are involved in already. Okay? So let's go through it, and um, so let's take a look at some of these clues. Now, how do we know this information? It's not you know, some uh, professionals just sitting down and saying, hmm, let me think of some clues. What we know is that you know, a lot of research is done. I, I'm a member of the American Association of Suicidology, and so they, for years, have been doing a lot of research on uh, you know, what about people who attempt suicide and live? What, you know, what do we know about their clues? What do we know, know about their thought processes and their emotions and so on? And so we've learned from people who've been through it and you know, tell us this is what was going, going on with me at the time. So as you see there, first one, which is depression. And there's, it's no coincidence that that one is listed first because that's a huge one. And uh, we're going to talk about depression, or at least I'm, I can give you some, um, a list of some of the symptoms of depression uh, that we're going to come up with. But one of the things I want to give you is a little formula that I, I uh, heard years ago. And it's just a beginning way to help us understand what depression is. It's D equals S times P. Depression equals sadness times pessimism. We've all been sad before, but when we combine it with a pessimistic attitude, that is the belief that things will, and here's a key word here, will never get better. Then you have the makings for depression. And so some of you sitting here today may be experiencing that now or you've experienced that in the past. But there are others of you who really just can't identify with that. Because one of the things that we know about depression is that it's a sense that I'm, I feel hopeless that, and helpless. I can't do anything about this, and things will never, ever get better. And so depression is a combination of both sadness and pessimism as a way to at least introduce us to the idea that Many people who attempt suicide and die from suicide um, are coping with depression. There are other um, emotional problems that go along with it as well. Some of you know the, the term bipolar disorder, which is the, old, the new term for manic depression. And um, eating disorders have a higher risk of, of suicide as well. And of course, substance abuse and alcohol uh, use and so on are issues that, that go along with it. Then um, statements such as, I won't be around anymore, I just can't take it anymore, I just can't go on. And one of the things that I think is important for us to do is, you know, be with someone in pain. That's a, that's a theme that I'm going to come back to again and again. And those of you in the helping profession, you know this. And I, um, let's see, how many of you are in the helping profession? Raise your hand here. Okay. All right. Um, so one of the things that that you know, you know is that you, you have to deal with people's pain. And so I came up with a little, a, you know, you're going to get some little acronyms and examples here. But one, one I came up with years ago, I call it APT-BIP, A-P-T-B-I-P, APT-BIP, A-P-T-B-I-P. And what it says is that your job when you're helping someone is to allow the person to be in pain. And those of you in the helping profession, I want to thank you for what you do. And you get up each day and you deal with people in pain, in physical pain, in emotional pain, who feel like they're going to be in it forever. And what we often want to do is we want to fix it, right? We want to, and we come up with all these cliches. And you, you know, you've heard about them before, right? I know just how you feel. It was God's will. God only gives me as much as I, you know, gives you as much as you can handle. I know a woman, her name is Margarita Suarez, who um, is in Seattle, and she does workshops. And she says, you know, whenever she hears someone say, God only can give you as much as you can handle, she goes, please, God, I'm wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. You know, don't, don't give me that much, right? So, you know, uh, our job then is to allow people to be in that pain and realize that you can't fix it. You can be there, but your job is to let them be in that pain. And, Another one, another clue we know is getting rid of personal belongings, number three on there. Um, things that, you know, how many of you have done collections before? Collecting something for a hobby? How many of you have done that before? Any sort of collection, right? Imagine doing all that work and then one day just giving it away. Like, why would you do that? And so, for some people, that's a clue that may indicate, 
you know, there's something going on there. Why, why are you doing this? Okay? And so when people make those statements, uh, you know, I won't be around anymore, I can't take it anymore, rather than saying, oh, come on, it's not a big deal, instead you say things like, what do you mean by that? You know, what's going on? You know, what, what's going on in your life that, that would bring you to that point? Okay? Or if you see them giving, you know, something away, saying, something going on here? Something happened in your life that, that brought you to this point? Then number four, statements of self-hatred. You know, it's an interesting statement. The sentence, I hate myself. Now think about that, you know? No baby is born hating herself, right? You know, a, a six-month-old me messes her diapers. So she doesn't go, I can't believe I did that, okay? You know, what's wrong with me, okay, right? So what does that tell us? It says we learn to hate ourselves, right? And so that statement, I hate myself, there's an I inside of my head hating a myself inside of my head. Same, it's the same brain, but it shows how we learn to judge, and we learn to judge ourselves. And so, you know, again, it's, it's something that says to us, there's something going on. And so the sentence for some people is, I hate myself and therefore, I'm, you know, I must die. Therefore, I'm this terrible person and I, I must take my life. Then another one is um, threats. You know, believing those threats. You hear that, that myth, myth out there that says, you know, people who talk about it don't do it. Well, you know, that may be the case for some people, but we have to take every threat seriously. And I've worked at, uh, how many of you have worked on a crisis line before? How many of you have done that? that you know, that, that I think if most of you know this. The scary thing about working on a crisis line is waiting for the phone to ring, right? Just wondering, is this going to be a suicide? Is just, are, are they looking for resources or what's going on? Okay? And so, you know, someone calls and, and says, um, you know, and, and then they call again, and then a week later they're calling again, and pretty soon you're like, well, you know, it's the whole boiled cried wolf thing. Well, we have to take, of course, every threat seriously, and, and sometimes that gets hard. Another one is a, acquiring a method, you know, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Another one is uh, withdrawing into self, you know, not going out, not answering. How many of you know someone who does texting? Anyone know anyone who does texting? Anyone know anyone who's addicted to texting? Anyone? Okay, all right. All right, don't look at the person next to you. I saw some of you went, you know, like that, right? Well, you know, that's been one of my issues in, in teaching college over the years, you know, the students doing one of these. So I have that, you know, uh, on my syllabus. I have no tolerance for texting. You want to text, you know, go outside. But, you know, we're in an uh, immediate response mode now, right? Someone texts you, you better respond, okay? And it's been four seconds, what's taking you, right? And so what begins to happen with people who begin to withdraw is that they're not responding to text, they're not responding to the phone, they're not going out with their friends, they, you know, they're closing off. Now, one of the things I want to make sure today is that I'm talking about generalizations. So as some of you are sitting here, you might say, well, that doesn't apply to that person, or that doesn't apply to me, or I don't know. And that, that may be the case. But what we're doing is sort of painting a broad picture here. And for some people, they don't withdraw, and, and they still make, may make a suicide attempt. Okay? Another one is vague physical complaints. Um, there's some research years ago that came out that showed that about one-third of all people who had attempted suicide had um, visited a doctor within three, uh, a three-month period uh, with vague physical complaints, things that you know, the doctor looked at and said, you seem fine. I, 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 don't, I don't see anything going on with you. And then you know, weeks or days, weeks or months later, this person made, made a suicide attempt. Now, you know, doctors are doing better screening, and they're really looking at, you know, asking those questions directly. Are, are you, you know, do you, have you had suicidal thoughts? And then preparing to leave, you know, putting one's house's order, you know, qu uh, quitting one's job, quitting church, quitting school, quitting the team, you know. What does that say, to quit the team? And then, as soon as you quit, now you're more isolated, and people are saying, how come you quit, and what's going on, or not, not going to church, or not, you know, not practicing your, you know, your own spirituality. So those, are, so those are some clues that may indicate something's going on here, okay? And so our job is, as we start to see some of that, to, to you know, not be afraid to, to ask that question, which we're going to get to in a minute. Then some emotional and thought patterns of people contemplating suicide. In other words, when we ask people who have um, made a suicide attempt, what were, you, what were you thinking? What were you feeling at the time? Here's some of the things that they said. One is ambivalence, okay? It's an interesting word, you know, ambidextrous means someone who can use one hand or the other hand, right? Ambivalence is someone who feels something over here and at the same time something over here. And that's quite often what goes on with suicidal feelings. 
they have a feeling that they want to die. I can't take this anymore. I can't go on. It's not worth it. I'm in too much pain. You know, let me out of here. Okay? And on the other hand, they have feelings of wanting to live. I mean, by the very fact that they're, that they're saying those things and they haven't done it yet, they're still alive. And, and, and that's good. Okay? And so in the same brain, ambivalence is going on. Another one is their, their, their emotional or physical pain, as we talked about before, from which they see no escape. And I, I see suicide, and I think those of you who know some things about it, as sometimes seductive. I want you to think for a moment that this room is your life. And everywhere you go in this room, you are in pain. Emotional pain, physical pain, that you then are trying to get out of. So you try various things in this room. You go over and stand in that corner, and that doesn't work. You lean against the wall, that doesn't work. You come up on the stage, that doesn't work. You stand over by the exit sign, you get under the curtains, you lie on the floor, you get under the chair. Everything you do doesn't work. And after a while, you start thinking to yourself, I can't take this anymore. This thing called life is too painful. So what you start thinking about is that door that I could leave. And that door becomes your method. A rope, a gun, pills, jumping, cutting, whatever that is. And you start thinking, yeah, I could do that. Now, of course, we don't know exactly what's on the other side of that door. We don't know what death is like. No one's ever been, a, been able to come back and say, this is exactly what your death is going to be like. But again, those of you who have not been in that situation need to understand that people are in so much pain, they don't care what's on the other side of that door. All they want is, I want out of here. Then you and I come along and we go, oh, come on. It's not that bad. I mean, try this. Look at that. Look at that. You know, and all I can think of is, I can't take this anymore. And so our job is to identify what that door is, identify what that method is, because suicide is seductive. It becomes a friend. And it sort of says, you know, I can take away all your pain. Things will be better. Just do this. And so you know, our job is to identify it and then get them some help. Because we're not going to be able to solve all the problems that are related to the pain in this person's life. We may think we do. But you know, our job is, you know, unless you're involved in counseling, our job is not to be this counselor. Our job is to find someone who's going to give them that help and especially that hope, that hope for the future. I've been reading a book. Uh, we, we started our cruise in Seattle on Sunday. And so um, we've been on the water a lot. And um, so I had a book on my shelf that I've never read. How many of you have a few books about this high waiting to be read? How many, right? And how many of you then go into the bookstore and you, what do you do, right? You buy more, right? Now we have Kindle, you know, you can buy 4,000 books, you know. So, you know, they keep, so the book is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. How many of you heard about that? First part of it is about him being in a concentration camp and so on. And, but it's the whole idea of meaning. You know, and he was talking about in the book about people just giving up, just curling up in a ball and saying, I, I can't take it in this concentration camp. Having one slice of bread a day and having this, you know, watery thin soup uh, given once a day and hoping that the person who's giving you the soup will dip to the very bottom to give you, some, you know, some of the good stuff. And, um, and for some people, they, they gave up. They just couldn't handle it anymore. And, you know, what, you know, what is that? And part of it is, you know, what, what is the meaning of my life? You know, it, it, can I see a future for me? And I, you, know, you think about it. Um, you know, for many people, their future gets, gets closed off, especially for young people. Okay? And one of the things about young people is that they, they have this sense of, of impulse, that they just do things. And we also know that, that when you're young, you know, 13, 16 years old, that you do things that sometimes involve risk. And when we, and I talk about this in my death class, and I say, you know, um, I want you to think back because, uh, you know, when you're that age, you engage in some risk behaviors. And, but if someone came up to you and said, you know, you could die doing those things. A 16 year old is pretty smart. They go, sure, I know I could die. But they don't really understand what death is, right? Then you talk to that 16 year old, oh, seven years later, right? Now you're talking to a 23 year old. Say, tell me about the things you did when you were 16. And the 23 year old goes, I could have died doing that. Okay? I can't believe I did those things, right? And so part of it is this whole idea of you know, understanding a little more about death when you're in your 20s, but still there's that whole sense of impulse control. And one of the things we know about alcohol, and one of the, one of the statistics that's absolutely clear, 
as about one-third to one-half of all people who have died from suicide had alcohol in their bloodstream at, at the time. In, in the year 2011, in the United States, there are going to be about 35,000 suicides. 35,000. And you know that you live in a state that year after year has been in the top five. Sometimes the, the, number, you know, the top state, sometimes one or two. But you have a huge challenge. I don't have to tell you that. By the very fact that you took time out here today to come, you know, that's something that's, you know, that's very important um, to, you know, to come out of here and say, all right, what can I do? What little thing can I do about it? How many of you heard of that whole starfish story? How many of you heard of the starfish story, right? You know, this guy's walking along and he sees this kid, you know, throwing starfish. You know, there's thousands of them out there, right? Throwing starfish into, back into the ocean because otherwise you're going to die. And, th and this guy's watching this kid do it. And he goes up to the kid and he goes, uh, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm trying to help the starfish. And he looks around with thousands of them out there. And he goes, that's not going to make much difference. And the kid says, makes a difference to this one. Okay. And that's your job because you're going to come across people who may be, you may be that person who can really listen for the first time and really allow that person to be in pain and not give those kind of cliches that other people have been doing and to help that person on to the, to the resources that they need. Okay. Number three is they may be intent on punishing people in, in their life. You know, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to show you. And, and uh, years ago, I was in, involved in, in counseling and I had a number of clients in grief and loss. I work at a place near Seattle called Good Samaritan neuropsychological services for people who experienced a, a, a head injury. And so I was a psychosocial counselor there. And, and some of these folks are really dealing with significant depression and dealing with um, their own loss of, of who they used to be. And so you know, part of it was you know, to ask them, you know, how are you going to take care of yourself? And let's work on anger and depression and issues that, you know, that, that come up. And you know, in some cases, people want to pay someone back. But what I say to them is one of the best ways if you want to pay someone back that you feel has hurt you in some way, is to find a way to go on and live a good life, right? To li live a life where they see you later and go, wow, they really moved on. They really did some things. But when you're in it, it's, you know, it's hard to do it, I know. Or wish to be a martyr, right? You know, the whole idea of putting yourself out there at risk, whether a person is a member of a gang and they're the person who's always taking the risk, or they joined the military. I, last year I was invited. How many of you have heard of the organization TAPS? Have you heard of TAPS? Tragedy Assistant Program for Survivors. I was invited um, to give a couple workshops down in Dallas and then um, at Fort Hood, just actually a month before the Fort Hood um, in incident took place and, and people died there. And so, you know, one of the things we talked about is sometimes people join the military because they want to be a martyr, okay? You know, my girlfriend just broke up with me and I'm going to join the army and I'm going to, I'm going to be in the front lines and if I die, I'll be, a, you know, I'll, everyone will, you know, be sad that I died, but I'll show her kind of thing. And so, there are all kinds of ways that people engage in self-punishment and, you know, part of it is to ask ourselves, is there a way that we can, you know, do it without hurting ourselves? Another one is they may try to use suicide to uh, punish themselves for an imagined uh, transgression. I did this terrible thing, and therefore I should kill myself. Um, they may believe that uh, their unbearable situation will, uh, situation will continue at the same level, or even what? Get worse. And that's what depressed people feel. That as terrible as things are today, tomorrow it's going to be just as terrible, and in fact may even get worse. And so you can't promise someone that tomorrow will be a better day. But you can promise them that at some point, you're not going to feel this lousy. As horrible as you feel today, at some point, you know, later on, um, you're going to look back on this. But I know right now that seems hard to do. And then suicide is sometimes viewed as sleep. You know, that's the closest that we come to anything related to death, right? But of course, in sleep, we always what? Okay. We always wake up. So when our brain tries to figure something out, it can only figure out things that we're familiar with, right? So we're familiar with, so for some people it's just, I, I just don't want to be here anymore. But there's this whole idea that maybe somewhere down the line that I'll wake up. All right, well, let's take a look now, now that we've taken a look at some clues, taken a look at some ways that people may think about suicide, is let's take a look at some steps in intervention, all right? In other words, you've gotten a feeling in your gut, 
something's going on here. Especially, you know, the better you know someone. And you feel like they're saying things that indicate to me that they may be suicidal, that, that they may be having some of these feelings. So, as it says there, first thing, when you suspect that a person is depressed and hopeless or any of these other clues, um, ask, your, ask the question, are you thinking of suicide? Now, I'm going to do something here, and Tammy's going to help me with this. Uh, I, and uh, uh, what I want are the people who are in the helping profession here. I'm gonna, uh, these are the folks I want you to help me with this. Because what I want you to do for a moment, I want you to imagine that you and I are friends and that you've seen some of the clues from me. I've said some of these things. And so it's like, oh my goodness, I need to ask the question. Because one of the things that I found over the years is that for many people, that question, are you thinking of suicide, gets caught in people's throats. Right? It's like, I can't ask that because we have this fantasy. The fantasy goes something like this. You know, you, uh, you see all these clues coming up, and so you say, okay, I'm going to ask the person. So you, so you have this fantasy that you go, so Bob, are you thinking about suicide? And the person goes, no, not really, but you know, that's a good idea. Thanks for bringing that up, right? As if somehow, now you've implanted that idea. But that's not how it goes, right? What you've done is, in many cases, you've spoken the unspeakable. You've asked the question that other people are too afraid to ask. Okay? So here's what I want you to think about for the helping folks um, so we can identify you in a moment. I'm going to then um, ask you to ask me the question, are you thinking of suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking of taking your life? Somewhere along the lines of, you know, to get to that question right away. So let's start with this group over here. Who's, who's in the helping profession? Raise your hand here. People go, not me. I'm not going to, okay? So why don't you get this lady in the blue right here, Tammy, okay? And so go ahead and tell us your first name. Delia. 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 Okay, Delia, go ahead. Um, you've, you've detected these clues. Go ahead and ask me if I'm suicidal or however you would like to ask it. Bob, um, are, you, are you suicidal? Yes, I am. I've been thinking about it a lot. Okay, somebody else back in this section. Okay, you got a lady in red back here, Tammy. Okay. What's your name? I'm Jean. Jean, okay. Bob, I've heard you talking a lot about uh, being depressed. Are you thinking of taking your life? Yes, I am. Okay. Somebody else over in here? Okay, someone over here? Okay, who else in the helping profession here? Okay, we got a lady. Okay, this man here. Okay, great. What's your name? Uh, Walter. Walter, okay. Bob, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Yes, um, I might hit myself. Uh, what else do you mean? Um, <clears throat> it sounds to me like you're thinking about uh, maybe wanting to take your own life. Yeah, I am. You got it? Really got to get to it. We got a lady up here in white in the second row here. And your name Hi. is? My name is Bev. Bev. And um, Bob, you've been talking a lot. Are you thinking about suicide? Yeah, I am. Okay. All right, you got that? And if I really push, when I teach my class, I do like 10 different students who, you know, they're like, but you got to be able to say it. All right? And for those of you who are wondering, no, I'm not myself actually thinking about suicide for the one where, you know, there's this guy up here having those feelings. The important point is get that sentence out of your throat, okay, and ask it. Don't be afraid of that, all right? Okay, uh, then number two is something called CPR. So how many of you know how to do just general CPR? How many of you have done that before? Raise your hand. Ah, a lot of people here. So what that tells me is if I'm walking along the streets of Juneau, and I happen to collapse, there will be people fighting over my body, right? <laughs> okay. I know, no, he's lying, no, let me hit, right? Okay. Which is great, this is, you know, that's wonderful. So CPR is something that literally can save a life, okay? I, I took CPR, my first CPR was like in 78, and six months <laughs> later, I came upon an accident scene, and you know, here's someone, you know, thrown out of his car, and I gave him CPR, and he lived for two more days, but, um, 
but I, I think I would have felt terrible just standing there not being able to do anything. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to do it, you know, it just feels good to feel like, okay, maybe, maybe I can save a life at some point. But what we're going to talk about is a different kind of CPR, as you see it, called suicide CPR. Okay? So, you know, when you see a person on the ground and you check their air and, and their heart and you see that they're not breathing, we know what to do. Now, we've gotten to a point where we've got some clues here and you realize, hey, I guess I need to start suicide CPR. So, of course, you ask the question. Now it's, all right, they're suicidal. What do I do now? So the C in there stands for, anybody reading this? What does it say? Current plan. Current plan. So once you realize that this person is suicidal, you don't have to do it right away, but certainly, you know, once you've listened to a little bit of their story, understood, you know, the, all the pain that they're in in this room, it's important to find out what their plan is, okay? In other words, not, the, the one sentence that I, I sort of stare away from is not, um, not a sentence I really kind of don't like is, how, how are you going to do it as if they've already decided to do it and you can't stop it anyway? But how might you do it? How, what method are you thinking about? You know, um, how, what might be a, a way that you might want to take your life, okay? So what's your method? How might you do it? Um, you know, what plan do you have? Uh, how might you, you know, you want to hurt yourself? So, so Tammy, let's, let's do that as well. Let's go over to these folks over here. Um, raise your hand if you're a professional here. Okay. All right. So, notice these people are going, I, no, I'm not. I've just changed my mind here. Your name is? It's Emily. Emily? Yes. Okay. So, Emily, I, I just said yes, that I'm suicidal. You've heard some of my pain, and now you're going to ask me about my method. Go ahead. Bob, how, have you thought about how you might take your life? I, I thought about a lot. Go ahead, ask. What have you thought about? Yeah. Um, my car. Okay. All right, now hand, hand the microphone to somebody else. Who else? Professional here that, uh, okay. So I've just said car. All right, what would, you, what would you want to know about car? Are you thinking about using your car to yes. kill yourself? Yes, I am. And how okay. would you do that? I'm, I'm just going to drive down uh, the, the, main, uh, the main highway and uh, smash into another car coming my way. Now, you might say, well, that might hurt someone else, and that's their fault. Right? I may be so into my own pain at, at that moment, I don't care. All right? So car. All right, someone else. Okay, your name is? Sherry. Sherry. You're going to ask about method, so we're going to start all over oh, again. Start over? Yeah. E, do you have a method, Bob? Yeah, um, I, got, I got these pills. What else do you want to know? Uh, have you tried pills before? Um, well, I took a couple of aspirin when I was younger, you know, four or five of them, and um, I really wasn't trying it, but, but yeah. I got these pills. But that's what you're thinking about now? Yeah. Anything yeah. else you want to know about the pills? What are they? Aspirin. Okay, so mm -hmm. am I going to die? Can you die from an overdose of aspirin? Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay, so for some people, oh, it's only aspirin. Well, guess what? You know, that that's a possibility. So it's assessing. You know, and then one of the ways to think about method is you you, you know you know you want to know what the method is. You want to know you know the when, where, right? Where are the pills? Okay, pills could be in my pocket. You don't want those pills to be, you don't want it to be, to be so accessible. All right, let's do one more for method. Someone else? Your name is? My name is Larry. Larry. How would you go about killing yourself? Um, I, got, um, I got this rope. Um, you guys have Home Depot here? Yeah, yeah. okay. Went to Home Depot and I got this rope and, uh, <coughs> yep, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use this rope. Where is the rope now? Rope is in uh, my garage, and uh, I got it over the rafter. It's, it's ready to go. It's in a noose, ready to go. Okay. So I got anything else you want to ask me? Uh, can we go to the hospital now? Yeah, good. <laughs> All right. Good question. OK, where's your car? All right, so is that uncomfortable? Yes. Is talking about suicide? Absolutely. Is asking about method uncomfortable? Yes. But you? might be able to save a life by doing that, as, as hard as that is. Okay. 
So, so now we got method, all right? Then next is prior behavior. Now someone asked about that already. You know, have you tried this before? Or do you know anyone else has tried this before? One of the questions that always comes up is, you know, is uh, um, suicide genetic? No. Okay. Now, depression may have a genetic predisposition to it, but suicide in it says so. But another question that goes along with it, can suicide run in families? And, and that answer is yes, okay? Because if my great uncle George died from suicide, I may look at all the ways of coping with my pain. One of them is how uncle George did it, right? And so, so in that sense, you know, there may be someone who's done that. Or as the question comes up, have you tried this before? Research indicates, and think about this for a moment, is that uh, of all people who attempt suicide, um, you know, I want you to think for a moment. Of all people who attempt suicide and live, and unfortunately most people who attempt suicide live, um, quite often they don't show up in the emergency room. 16-year-old guy takes an overdose of pills intending to kill himself and he wakes up the next day and he's still alive, right? So, and he may never tell anybody. So um, there may be a lot of attempts that, that we don't know about. But, um, so I want you to think about for a moment, I want you to turn to someone and ask them to guess. Of all people who attempt suicide, what percent of people never try it again? That is with five year, 20 year, 30 year follow up on did they ever attempt again? What percent of people who survive? So turn to someone, if you haven't met someone already, say hi, what's your name? And what's your guess of percent of people who uh, survive one suicide attempt who never try it again? So go ahead, find somebody. Hi, what's your name, what's your guess, okay? What percent never try it again? Okay, let's see how things are going here. Good. Okay, so come on back. Come on back and let's see where we are. Research indicates that it's somewhere around 70% or so. Never try it again, okay? That's a huge number. They did an interesting study. It's called the Golden Gate Bridge Study. Um, I attended the American Association of Suicidology Conference in San Francisco about 20 years ago. And one of the workshops we had was on um, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and so we jumped on a bus, went out to Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, we're in this room and we can see the bridge right here. And they talked about the various ways that they have attempted to stop people from jumping off the bridge. And um, at that point, 20 years ago, more than 1,000 people had jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. Out of those 1,000, I want you to think for a moment, how many survived? Okay. Think for a moment, because there were survivors off the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. Just think for a moment, and come up with a number in your head. Actually jumped. Jumped, they jumped off the bridge, yes. So I'll turn to someone and say, what's your number? Okay, what would you guess? Okay, what number? Out of a thousand, how many survived the jump? And the answer is 11, 11. Now why did they survive, just by the way? And uh, what they did is they did a follow-up of these 11 people. One woman, a few months later, went and jumped off again and she died that time. The other 10 people, when they asked them, how do you feel now about your suicide attempt? And every one of them said, I'm so happy that I survived. And they've asked people over the years who have jumped off something and survived. They were caught by an awning or bushes or whatever. What were you thinking on the way down when you let go? And for some people, they said, my mind was totally blank. But of those people who were thinking anything, the most common thought was, oh my God, I made a mistake. That's what they were thinking on the way down. Okay. So of course, you know, jumping is, is a point of no return. Okay. Uh, people who do, who do hanging often think that they can change their mind at the last moment. And people who've experienced a rope breaking or something, the rafter breaking or something, what they found was, and then later on said, what were you thinking at the time? And they said, well, what I was thinking was that as, as the rope was around my neck, I kept thinking, well, I could change my mind at any, at any moment. And some people actually then tried to grab, you know, grab the rope.
and un undo it. And what, what they realized was, in order to have enough slack in the rope, you have to be able to have the strength to pick up your own weight with one hand. Okay? And even with a lot of adrenaline running through your, through your body at the time, you're, you're likely not going to be able to do that. So for many people, we suspect, who have died from hanging, um, they may have struggled and, and weren't able to do it because they thought that, that they, could, they could go back and save themselves, and they couldn't. Okay. So uh, I remember this man and I, after the workshop, we walked out to the Golden Gate Bridge, and we, and we looked down, and the water looked so calm and all that. And we were, what is it, 250 feet up or whatever. And, um, and I, I could see how inviting that, that could look. But how many of you have ever jumped into the water or dove into the water and did what we can call a belly flop. How many of you have done that before, right? How did it feel, right? Okay. And how high were you, right? Yeah, yeah. I had one student go, I think I was about two feet, you know, and it really hurt. Okay. Because the surface of the water, when, when you hit it, is like cement, right? And so that's why, you know, 989 people out of 1,000, you know, had died. But I think that I think the results of, of those survivors is very telling, okay? is that you know, we are happy that, that we survived. Now, there, there are, so we switch those numbers around, about 30% of all people who make a suicide attempt um, do make a second attempt at some point in the future. And those folks have a higher death risk. And, and you know that, that, that whole um, saying that person goes, you know, I failed this first time, and this time I'm going to be successful. Now, now, um, and so that's asking the question, have you attempted before, gives you a little more information about is this person, you know, wanting, wanting to do this again, and uh, have they gotten to this point again, and that, that, that's just more information. Doesn't mean they're going to treat this person any different, it just says we have a little background on, on you know, what brought, to, brought them to that point again, all right? So uh, let's take a look at, so there's the C, the P, and then what's the R? Resources, resources. So resources, critical. So you ask the question, you assess what, you know, what's going on with um, the method, you talk about um, a prior behavior. Oh, before I go to resources a little more, let me, let me go back to the, the P for prior behavior. Another part that I want you to consider for P is what we talked about already, is to make sure that you really hear that person's pain. Okay. What brought you to this point? And then I think a very powerful question I heard from a, a suicidologist, someone who studied suicide years ago, is I love this question, is that now this person has told you about their pain. And you ask the question, what's kept you going this long? I love that question. You've been going through a lot. What's kept you going this long? And in you know, the book that I've been reading, you know, he talked about it. You know, why would you live in this camp day after day thinking that you could die at any moment. What keeps you going, right? And then, if a person says, uh, you know, what, well, what used to keep me going was my belief in God, then your question is, what's changed for you? What's important is that you don't lay your beliefs on that person. You, know, you have your own spirituality, uh, if you do, and you start to lay it on them and say, well, if only you believe in God like I do. Well, guess what? That person may start to even feel more distant from you, because for them at the time, you know, now, that doesn't mean if and you can't ask, they have a belief in God, and they might say yes, and if they say yes, you can say, well, what do you think God would say about your suicide? What if you were face-to-face -face with God? Okay. You know, what, um, but on the other hand, if they feel distant from God, you know, that's, that's not for you to go there at that point. It's, you know, it's, it's where they are. So be with them in their pain. Find out what got them to the point, and then find out what changed. Maybe for them, it's, you know, what's kept you going this long? You know, my children. Okay. So, What's the name of your children? What are their names? Okay. And how do you think your child, you know, you say have a four-year-old daughter named Sarah, okay? How do you think Sarah would react if she found out that her father killed himself? Okay. And that's harsh, but it's a very, it's a fact, okay? And it's not something that you're shoving in that person's face. It's something that you're saying, how do you think, your, you know, your child would react in this? So be with them in their pain and find out where they are with this. Maybe another thing they, they kept the going was their stubbornness. Yeah. But where'd that stubbornness go? Where'd that, you know, where'd that, I'm going to make it through this, where did that go? And how can, you know, we find a way for you to get that back? Again, you're not trying to solve all their problems. That may be an issue that, that certainly can come up with, you know, with counseling. 
All right? So, so resources, you know. That is, who else besides me can help you get through this? Your brother, your sister, your friend, your minister, you know, your coach, your teacher, your mom, your cousin, you know, somebody else. The important thing that I always say to my students is, don't do this alone. Because that person may say to you, especially if you've been listening to their pain, we can't tell anyone, oh, you're the only person that I, I trust now. You're the only per you know, just in, your response to that is, I care too much for you for us not to get someone else involved in this. Now, who else can we talk to? You know, what's great today about cell phones and all this, you know, you got, we call your brother. No, I don't want to talk to my brother. Okay. Well, how about, let's talk to your mother. I, no, my mother, I don't, my mother. Okay. Well, you know, what about your sister? Well, I don't know. I, I don't want to bother her. And so, you know, what you can say is, all right, well, let's, let's flip that over. What if it were your sister that were hurting instead of you? Would you want your sister to tell you what was going on that brought her to this point? And of course, for most people, the answer is, you know, well, it sounds like your sister needs to know. So, and of course, quite often in early on in the helping for profession, we feel like we need to do things. It's like, no, you're not the one that's going to be call the sister. You encourage that person to call. And, and sometimes I find it helpful to do a little rehearsal. Say, okay, you're going to call your sister. What's her name? Uh, her name's um, Terry. All right, so you're going to call Terry. And what are you going to say? Well, that I've been feeling kind of down. And, uh, yes, and then what? Well, that I just wanted to talk to her. No, I, it's important that you use the word suicide. Or it's important that you use the word, I feel like I want to take my life. So that you really get to the honesty of what's going on here. Okay? And she needs to know this. It really sounds like so you're getting someone else involved in this process, uh, not, and not just you. And especially those of you who, how many of you um, at some point in the future, you're not involved now, but want to get involved in the helping profession? How many of you are aspiring students in the helping profession? Okay. And one of the things that I think is, is important is that you don't fall into the trap of, of thinking that you're the only person that can save that person. Because you and I, and I'm going to say something pretty harsh, are not guaranteed that we're going to be here tomorrow. And if you are the one person, only the person, who can help, uh, uh, supposedly help that person, then you die tomorrow, then, then what? So get other people involved, even though they're saying it's only you, okay? No, L who else can help us with this? All right, then uh, number three, find ways to immediately put distance between them and their method. So I had a car, right, that I wanted to, I wanted to kill myself with. So someone have an idea of what we might do to help with the car? Okay. Why don't you take a microphone over here? And what's your, what's your name? Brenda. I Brenda. take your keys away. Take the keys away. Now, would you wrestle me to the ground? I might. You might. You might. All right. Well, let's let's hope that you don't have to. Okay. But instead, you say, Bob. You know, how about if I have your keys? Well, why? Well, uh, because I'm just concerned about you now. Okay. Um, and and that that might may do that. But if I don't, then you need some sort of promise from me that I'm not going to hurt myself until I get some help, right? Okay. So then another one was um, pills, right? So what would you do with the pills? Take them away, okay? Again, would you wrestle them away from me? Now, on the surface, it's like, yeah, I'm going to take those pills away from me. But the point is, you know, you tick me off, I'm just going to go get some other pills, right? What you want to do is get me to the point where I go, okay. Here's the pills, right? Uh, when I was involved in counseling, one day uh, we were moving our office from one building to another, and I got to work later on that, uh, that afternoon, and my supervisor came to me and said, well, I just, uh, just so you know, I covered for you today. I go, what do you mean? He said, they said, well, when we, we were moving your desk, your drawer fell open, and there were like 20 pill bottles in there. <laughs> and people said, what is Dr. Bob doing with all these different, with different names on there as well? And then she had to explain that, you know, guess what? People came to me, were suicidal, here's the pills I'm going to use, can you give me the pills? All right, and so let's talk about, let's get you some help. Well, because you don't want them available. You don't want them in, your, in their pocket. You don't want them, you know, right here, all right? And then the other one was a rope, right? So what do we do with a rope? What do we do? Them. Take it down or have them take it down, right? Can you give me the rope? You just don't want it available so they can reach out and grab it, right? That, that's the ideal. Okay, so uh, the worst thing you can do, as a question always comes up, the worst thing you can do is dare them, right? I mean, think when you were younger, right? And you did something and the teacher said, 
Why'd you do that? Because he dared me, right? And then Johnny, you know, then they always ask, well, if Johnny dared you to j j jump off the bridge, would you jump? You know, I always, I, when I was eight years old, I go, yes, I would, you know. And, no, you wouldn't, you know. The whole idea is that you do things quite often pe because people dare you, okay? Um, so uh, don't, don't dare them. Don't try to solve all the problems uh, in one day. You know, you're not their counselor. You know, suicide is serious. Get professional help. And as you talk with a person, you have two important goals. Be a good listener. In fact, I've just worked on this. Um, you know, my, my email is here. For those of you who are interested in the next, hopefully in the next month or so, I, I've given, I give a lecture, I teach a class in human relations, and I give about a two hour lecture on how to be a good listener. And uh, my son's gonna help me, and we're gonna put it either in 10 minute segments or half hour segments if we can, onto YouTube. And um, I, for years I've been giving that lecture, and, after my students finish the human relations class and I ask them to, to comment on the things that they learn in that class, how to be a good listener is, is so, you know, it's like at the top of their list. They realize that they thought they were a good listener, right? That we often think that a counselor is someone who gives good advice, right? And that, you know, it's not what a good counselor is. A good counselor is someone who sits with you and lets you come to your, own, your conclusion that's really gonna be best for you and your life at that point. But, you know, so the whole idea of being a good listener. And, the, and I write at the top, you know, when I write it up on the board, I write, show you care. That's number one, in whatever way that you can. Whether it's giving that person a hug or shaking their hand or just sitting there with them or just saying, you know, I care for you or I love you or you are so important in my life, you know, I, I, I want to do anything to help you get through this. And then the second thing I write up there is shut your mouth, right? You know, that's important that we learn how to do that. And I say to my students, as long as you're doing, you know, less than 40% of the talking, then you're probably helping out, okay? But quite often we think if we do a lot of this, you know, then, you know, we're really helping. But sometimes, you know, toning it down. And then related to that is permit silence. <laughs> and silence is tough. You know, you're sitting with a 14-year-old whose girlfriend has broken up with him, and for him, it's the end of his life, right? How many of you men sitting here, as a kid, when you were a teenager, had someone rip your heart out, right? You know what I'm talking about, that person who left you. How many of you guys would be willing to admit that, right? Okay. Hard work, isn't it, right? Yeah. I'm still thinking of Shirley when I talk about this, right? You know, why did Shirley do this to me, okay? But, so you got it? It's, and, and for us to say, oh, come on, there's more girls out there, or it's not a big deal, you know, that's not what they need. When you go through a breakup, it's loss. You are in grief. And what's grief? Well, we're going to talk about that later. But the whole idea is trying to minimize it is, you know, is not what they need. Okay? So uh, be a good listener and let the person talk about their problems and be active in moving the person toward finding reasons to live and resources to help. Okay? So th the next page has some uh, clues for depression, and they're pretty self-explanatory. There's the formula that I mentioned, D equals S times P. Depression is this combination of sadness and pessimism. And then uh, here is a, uh, a mnemonic device, a little memory device, from the American Association of Suicidology, uh, where it says, is path warm? And so the I stands for ideation, you know, or do they have thoughts of suicide? The S is for substance abuse, uh, increase or excessive uh, alcohol use. Uh, then purposelessness, sort of the hopelessness that we've talked about. Anxiety, we often think of depression as being down, but quite often depression involves a sense of um, feeling anxious. Then T, uh, so we got P, A, T, the T is trapped. Um, H, there's hopelessness coming up again. Then W is withdrawal as we talked about. A for anger. Sometimes, especially among young people, depression may be camouflaged by anger, right? Leave me alone. No, I don't care. You know, I don't want to talk about that. No, you know. And, you know, people do that all the time. But what you see is this increased. And so sometimes someone's sitting down with, with this young person and saying, you know, what's going on? Nothing. Well, you know, you seem to be jumping on people. And are there things happening? in your life you want to talk about? And then the important thing is as soon as you ask that question, do that famous thing, shut up. Okay? Um, and then reckless, um, taking those risks. And then mood changes. 
And you know, back to the question, which is a very powerful one, about, about firearms and the availability of it. You know, as soon as you do realize that someone is having any of these clues from suicide, I think it's very important to ask about, you know, um, do they have a firearm? And what can we do to make it so it's not so available so that they can get through some of this stuff? Because the good news is that depression doesn't last forever. And feeling suicidal doesn't last forever. It feels like it, it will. But as Dr. Kiernan talked about, you know, there are a number of resources out here. And you know, finding ways to get the person through this time, very difficult time period. All right, did you learn some things today? Yes. All right. All right, thanks for coming. Um, and let's have, some, uh, let's have some applause, yeah. And we have a couple, uh, we have some questions, right? Um, the first question that I've got here is um, back to our suicide intervention topic. How do you determine when to call the police when talking with a suicidal friend or a suicidal client? Yeah, call, you know, calling the police is a huge step, but when it's clear that they have the method there and they're ready to use it, then that's the time. When, in the suicide intervention training that I do, you know, we, we put together a scenario where it's clear that that person is moving forward with, in this case, carbon monoxide poisoning and you realize over the phone that that person's going to do it. So in that, in that sense, you know, um, you know, when you realize that that person has, has a method and they're ready to use it, you know, unfortunately you have to, have to move to that step. Although I, any, any of the folks out there who want to add, add something to that, um, you know, a very important part. Yes? The next question is, has there been research on how thrill rides or adrenaline sports affect depression and suicide? Yeah. There may be, I'm not aware of that, but you know, there, are, there is something in psychology called sensation seekers. That there are some of you right now who, as you're sitting there, uh, you know, you're already sort of aroused, right? And so any more sensations, like, no, I don't want any more of that. You know, how many of you don't like roller coasters, right? How many of you are not interested in bungee jumping and skydiving and all that, right? Okay, so you may not be sort of a sensation seeker. The other people who are sitting and have very sort of low um, arousal levels, and, and they're the ones who are more likely to seek. But, you know, seek out those kinds of sensations. But, um, uh, but I don't know to what extent it's, it's related to depression. It might be related to bipolar disorder. Um, yeah. Um, are there free counseling services for those who do not have insurance? Great. There are, you have SOS groups. Uh, um, who wants to speak to that for a moment? Dr. Kiernan, you want to? Go ahead. Free counseling services for those who don't have insurance. Um, in terms, you know, if you don't have formal insurance, if you go to that website again and look at the nonprofits, I think um, working with the nonprofits, you might have um, some luck. Of course, with hospice, uh, insurance is not required, and they do have counseling services there. Okay, I want to turn to someone and say, I'm glad you came here today, and let's hear some applause for all of you.